I'm Robert Merritt. I live my whole life here in Union County. I was born in um, New Albany here, and I grew up in rural county in Myrtle. Uh, we were we were pretty much isolated to where where I grew up simply because we just didn't go anywhere. We stayed at home. And that was just our atmosphere. That's where we, that's where we were, that's where we stayed. Uh, when I was about five or six years old, uh, my daddy went to see a man over in the Beulah area of Myrtle to trade cattle with him. And uh, we got there and, you know, I just saw something that I had never seen before. And uh, it, I was just mystified. There was a group of men playing at a baseball field called a crossroads. And this was a pretty much predominantly African American baseball facility. It was just a pasture is what it was. And they had a pond out in the outfield. But there was a group of people out there and they were playing baseball against each other. And I was just mystified. I just fell in love with that atmosphere. They were barbecuing chicken. They had drinks and wash tubs, and they were standing around, people just standing around talking and laughing, and just having the best time. I didn't want to leave. Of course, my daddy was in, involved in the trading of cattle and raising cattle, and he wasn't too much interested in the baseball game. But that memory stuck with me pretty much for a lifetime. And as I grew a little bit older, I was able to go and play on some of these fields where prior to integration, you know, we just got together and played. There were there were there were white people and black people both in these facilities, and some of the white guys played on some of the black guys' teams, and vice versa. And shortly after that, I became friends with a lot of those guys. We just grew up playing baseball together and had the best time. Um, as I got into uh, school, you know, there was something that was evident as as it could be in in Myrtle School and that was basketball. And sports just became something that just just became an obsession with me. I loved the games. We didn't get to go to all the games in those days, but we were able to go to some of the home games. Um, <clears throat> I remember a really good player in those days. We had, uh, we had actually two of these guys. We had a big red chun and we had a little red chun. Big red chun played in the early 60s. And he was such a good basketball player until there were some people in the community that thought he needed to play another year or two. And uh, they wound up, and you know, as they say, some stories become legends. When the story becomes legend, you print the legend. And uh, they felt like that he needed to play an extra year or two, and there were some people that got together and supposedly got his birth certificate changed so that he could play another year. Well, everything was fine with that until he got old enough to draw Social Security. When he went to the Social Security office, they said, wait a minute, you're not old enough. He said, yes, I am. They said, not according to that. But that's one of the stories that uh, came out during that time. But Big Red Chun was a fantastic basketball player. You know, he would get mad and just get on the floor, and he was really intense, and, and he was just a really good player. Later on in 1968, his little brother came along, and he was Little Red Chun. And he played with Ellis Thomas, James Kilo, some of those people on the 68 team that I think they were 43 and three and got beat in the finals of the state tournament. Uh, Larry Coon missed, a, I think, missed a, a free throws at the end of that game to uh, have a chance to, to, to win it. But basketball in those times was just absolutely, it was just absolutely the, the, the main thing that, that, that caught on with everybody and especially me. Just shortly after the 68 team, you know, I got into junior high school and high school and was able to start playing and practicing with people like Jerry Reno, who was one of the best players that ever hit this country. Jerry came to Myrtle and played high school basketball. He would actually went to Pine Grove for a while and then played at Myrtle. Jerry was a um, fantastic basketball player, but he was also a showman. Every time Jerry scored a basket, he would do the Tweety Bird sign, and it just infuriated the other teams around. In that particular year, Myrtle and West Union played in the finals of every tournament 
that they were in. And they also played in the final tournaments of the district, sub-district, North High, and the finals of the state championship. And West Union actually beat Myrtle for the state championship in 1970-71, I believe is the school year. A little bit after that, I was able to play high school basketball. And I, I you know, I, I thoroughly enjoyed it. I, I found an opportunity somewhere around my 10th grade year and I started working toward being a basketball player. And if I missed one day out of that year, I don't remember it. I think I pretty much practiced and worked the entire year. And I was able to play in my junior year. And I just loved it. I wound up playing my senior year. We had a pretty good year. We wound up and we played uh, Potts Camp several times that year. We were able to beat Potts Camp. Potts Camp went on and win, won the state championship, and we wound up and got put out early in the district tournament. John Stroud and West Union actually put us out, and that, I, you know, I've always told people that was the beginning of his career. Uh, shortly after that, I began to play a little semi-pro ball. I didn't go to college right out of high school. I graduated at 17 in April of, of 1973. And I was just young and didn't know what direction that I wanted to go. I know I, I knew I loved sports, um, but I just didn't, I just didn't go at that particular time. And I worked a couple of years and met some people within the time playing semi-pro baseball and in Memphis and uh, in and around New Albany here and uh, went to college and became a coach. And really that's all I ever wanted to do was coach. So I started coaching here in New Albany with uh, Harvey Childers, who I had played for in high school basketball. Um, began to coach football, which I, I never had any dealings with football, but um, you know, Coach Jones came to me when they were talking to me about a job and he asked me if I would help them and I just simply told Coach, I'll do anything you tell me to do. So I was able to work with Coach Jones for a while and Coach Childers in New Albany. and. Uh, Somewhere around, well, after the 85 season, we were in the state tournament several times in basketball. In 85, we were 36-0 and 0, and uh, won the state championship. Had a great group of guys. Johnny Payton, Chester Strickland, some of those guys were just fantastic kids and fantastic players. And uh, life kind of made a twist and a turn for me. And uh, I started coaching high school bas baseball. And I coached high school baseball at New Albany for several years. And uh, we began to build a team, build a program. We began to uh, work with our 8th, ninth, and 10th graders and play JV games with them on every time that we played a high school game. And then year after year after year, that program began to feed itself because those 8th, ninth, and 10th graders began to play as juniors and seniors on the varsity team. Occasionally, I'd have an 8th or a ninth grader that um, was able to play on the high school team. I remember Robert Gordon, who was, went on to be a great high school coach at Myrtle, was one of the grittiest, toughest little kids I'd ever seen come through there, and he played, I think he played a little bit as an eighth grader for me. Um, and shortly after that, I, I, you know, a life made another twist and a turn, and um, I was able to go back to coaching basketball, but I was coaching junior high basketball at uh, at the middle school in New Albany. And we had some really good teams and some really good years there. And <clears throat> we wound up, I think the first two or three years, we didn't even lose a game. And uh, then those players went on to uh, coach with Warner Bradford at the high school, play with Warner, excuse me. But uh, they won a state championship there. And if they had not changed classifications, you know, they moved up a classification there and got into the higher classifications. We were in the lower level of uh, the, the class that we were in. And once we moved into the bottom level of the next class, it was kind of tough on us at that time because we, we were a school, high school of 500 and we were competing against schools of 1,000 or 1,200 at that time. So the numbers were not, they were not compatible. But if that had not happened, Coach Bradford might have won about three state championships in a row because he had really good teams right there. He won, he won one of those, but he possibly could have won three with the teams that he had. Um, shortly after that, I, you know, you know how life just turns and twists for you. Um, it, it twisted to me 
so that uh, I was able to get into school administration. Once I got into school administration, I still stayed with the sports as much as I can. You know, after I after I kind of lost basketball in 1985, I started doing something that uh, I really didn't ever think I'd ever do, which was become a high school basketball official. And I got into that, and there was some of the best people I'd ever been around in my life. You know, they, you know, a lot of people didn't think so because they called here in Union County, but they were really good guys. Tommy Morton, Tommy Patterson, uh, Stan McAnally, um, Eddie Martindale, and I began to, to, to meet and know all of these. I'd already known all of the coaches of, in, you know, of the area, so I began to really get to know the officials of the area, and I really enjoyed it, and I had a good time, and I worked several state championships, and actually was able to work some junior college and junior college state championships. And I think the last year that I officiated, I worked um, the high school all-star team, all-star game, and then the junior college all-star game, and my daughter was coming into high school and I wanted to see them play and I had some kids that I had really been involved with when my daughter was young that were coming into the high school team and that group of girls that came in were able to win the first high school state championship that New Albany girls ever won. Um, after, after going into administration and having to kind of stop officiating, I had to I had to supervise the games most of the time. Uh, I was able to move, you know, as from a middle school administrator into the central office and became a, an athletic director for the for the whole district, for the high school and the uh, middle school. Chuck Garrett and I got to working on some things and we got to looking at these disparity in numbers. And he and I started in the background talking to people, going to see people, and taking the effort to say, hey, you know, th this is not right. We've got five classifications here, and we're sitting here in New Albany with a group of, say, 500 students, and we're competing against somebody that's got a that's got a thousand students or 1,200 students. I said the number, we just the numbers are just not right. So he and I did a lot of work in the background. We actually went down to Jackson on several occasions talking to people, and finally, <coughs> we were able to. Um, get with the executive committee of the MHSAA and we were able to convince enough of those people to vote to send us into six classifications which crunched those numbers closer together. Even now, right now, this next school year, they will go to seven classifications. So, they're, they, you know, they're beginning to see the difference in, in having those large numbers of kids playing against a, a larger number group of uh, students over here. Well, that was a big deal for us at that time, and it was a big deal to, to get it done. Um, I was tickled to death the, the day that I opened up the newspaper and saw that the MHSAA had voted to go to six classifications, and I think that was one of the really good accomplishments that we were able to do while we were here at New Albany. You know, we were able to hire some good people. Um, we had we had good teams. I think I think that one of the things that I'm most proud of is the people that we hired while I was at New Albany in sports. We tried to hire the people that really cared about the kids. We wanted them to make sure that they that they set their program on a standard that they worked hard with the kids, they worked hard themselves, and that they were doing everything they could to teach those kids right and treat them right and teach them things that sports will teach you that nothing else will teach you. I learned that from sports. I, I, had, uh, I had as many lessons in, in, in life that came from sports that uh, could possibly be. I, I've told people many times that I learned as much about school administration from, play, from playing basketball and working with Harvey Childers as I, as I did anywhere. Um, it's something that uh, that still encompasses my life now. I've got my grandchildren in school at West Union. My grandson plays basketball there in the junior high. I've got a granddaughter that's coming right behind him that, that I hope will play volleyball and basketball there. And then I've got two other grandchildren that uh, that I'm already working with them in the gym some at night and teaching them how to shoot and teaching them how to dribble. And uh, hopefully they'll be something that I can just spend as much time as I can watching them play. 
I started back officiating high school basketball two years ago. And I just fell in love with it again. Matter of fact, I'm gonna officiate a game tonight. I'm 67 years old. You know, I can't catch those kids anymore running them down the floor, but I can stay up with them just a little bit. And uh, I, I really enjoy it. It's, um, it's just been a blessing in my life to be able to really have been involved in sports and to, to have played the games that I played and to have coached in some of the state championship games and to have officiated in those games and uh, continue to sit in the stands now and just hope that, that my grandkids and the kids around them have the opportunity to learn from some of the best people that they'll ever be around and learn some of the lessons in life that sports can teach. Number one, I think from the, from, from the high school time that I played with Harvey Children, the first thing I learned was you better, have your, you better have yourself on time. You better understand how to tell time because if you can't tell time and be on time, you can't be in my program. If he said we were gonna leave at a quarter to five, that bus door closed at a quarter to five and that bus pulled out. If you were pulling up like some kids today think that they can be a minute or two late and it'd be okay, it wasn't okay. We were taught to be early. And, and, and today, you know, I just, I, sometimes I blow people out of the water when it's time to go somewhere because I'm 15 minutes early of being 15 minutes early. And that's one of the things that I learned from him. I learned from playing basketball from him that you are going to dedicate yourself to that program, to that team. You are going to concentrate on your task while you're here. You're not going to be thinking about anything else. You're not going to be talking about anything else. You're going to focus your attention on what we're doing today. You're going to do your best to learn it. And if you don't learn it, we're going to do it over. And if you don't do it to my expectations, we may do a little running after practice. So, you know, it, those things that you that you learn from sports, you, you learn how to dedicate yourself to a, to a cause. You learn how to get yourself up, get yourself ready, get there, prepare yourself. You learn how to concentrate on what you're doing. People ask me all the time, what was the secret to Harvey Childers' success? And I, I tell them, you won't believe it if I tell you. And I'll go on to tell them was, is that he kept everything as simple as he possibly could. There was no extravagant game plan. There was no extravagant game plays. We in practice had as tough a practice as we were gonna have in a game. Every drill, everything we did in practice was accountable and you were watched and you had to, you had to prepare for that and you had to be ready and you had to do it to a certain level. And that was the secret to his success. The kids weren't joking around or they weren't playing. They were concentrating on what they were doing. We did that in high school and his teams that I helped him coach with did that. My, part of my job was to be with, you know, the post people or the, the guards and whatever we were doing. Those kids had to pay attention to what they were doing. They had to be in defensive position. They had to have their hand in the passing lane. And they had to, they had to do exactly what was expected of them. And focusing on your task and putting putting your entire thoughts and, and, and energy into doing something in practice and you take and you turn that into the game, that's the secret to his success. I mean he was just that good and that you know, if the kids that played for him, most all those kids that played for him went on to be successful people because they had been through a program that taught things and that you know that was important to me when I was hiring hiring teachers or hiring coaches you know I mean I want you to work at it I want you to do it like it should be done and I want these the kids to learn as much as they can learn in basketball in math class or whatever it was just it was just things that that, that you could just catch on to and just latch on to and say hey this is this, this is good this is really good stuff here um, I think one of the first things I did when I was a principal is um, I kind of took his theory on if you're going to do it, you're going to do it right. And if you don't do it right, you're going to do it over. Um, I put some kids that were that, that struggled in math. They got their regular math class. And then I worked out a schedule and gave them a second math class 
so that they could hear it from another teacher. They were hearing basically the same things, but they were hearing the same things from another person. And you know, that was one of the things that helped those kids gain in their student achievement. And um, it was just, it was just plain old basketball coaching principal. In those days, in those days, the difference the difference in a baseball facility and a pasture was did you have cows on the, the, the field that they you know they'd move the cows off for the field and we would shovel manure off the field and go out there and play but uh, that's just where we played it's the only place we had to play now there were several of those around here there was one in Martintown called St. Mary's there was one in New Albany at the compress and then there was one at Mr. Lon Rutherford's place at um, out toward Beulah called a crossroads. And I know there were several others around and I'm not the greatest person to tell you the history of that. I think there's a great story in that because there's a lot of people that are still around that played on those places that, um, you know, I think, you know, they're getting to the age now that somebody needs to talk to them and get a good story out of them because there's some really good stories to come out of that. But, um, you know, when, I, when the first time I saw that, you know, I, I mean, the only time we got to see a, a baseball game was, you know, when we could get the antenna turned in the right direction on the game of the week on Saturday and maybe pick up Dizzy Dean and Pee Wee Reeves talking about the Yankees and watching that game. But, um, you know, I guess for the first time I saw it, it was a facility. It wasn't just a pasture. They took and they transformed a pasture into a facility. And, uh, you know, playing a little bit later on in life, there was was a, was an experience and uh, and it's something that I that I knew I wanted to do and we just I mean we just got along and had the best time that you could have I don't remember us having any arguments or fights or anything like that we just got out and played baseball we take up a few dollars to hire somebody to call the games and and some of those guys uh, some of those guys that um, that were playing. We got to be good friends with, and they actually came over and started playing with us before, before the baseball fields kind of died out, and we started getting city facilities and sports plexes and things like that, and uh, it turned over to, to adult softball at that time. And there was some, there were some adult softball teams in this area that um, could play with people in anywhere in the country. I mean, just absolutely some of the best players you've ever seen. Uh, some of those people played. Uh, gosh, up until they were 60, 70 years old, and uh, they were out there. They were out there two or three nights a week and on the weekends. And you know, there is there is such a rich history of sports right here in Union County and New Albany and the surrounding areas. And just take a look. Just ta just take a look at the, the high school sports. Uh, Norris Ashley. Norris Ashley is the winningest high school coach in the state of Mississippi, and I think he has more state championships than anybody out there. If Harvey Childress had it stayed in high school coaching with the state championships that he won at Northeast and and you know coming back, I think they'd be neck and neck to see who who was that. I mean that just tells you how important it's been to the area here and the people and. You know, one of the things that we do every morning is we get together out at the Myrtle Quick Stop store out there and we sit and talk and uh, there's a lot of conversation about the uh, older teams in the, in the late 50s and early 60s and the players, and some of the great players and the state championships and, you know, some of the teams that were there and the coaches and, you know, some of the things. There's some funny stories that, that goes along with it. But I've learned a lot. I've learned a lot just sitting and talking to some of the people that played during that time. And, and that generation, that generation is kind of going away, you know. It, and it's, 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 it's part of the history of the of Union County. But it's something that uh, really catches my attention. And, and I get up every morning and the first thing I do is get ready and head to the coffee shop at Myrtle and hope that there's good conversation flowing. What time do y'all meet there every day? Well, we got about two or three groups that comes in out there. They start about 5.30 in the morning. Some of them might get there at 5. And that one group will stay from about 5.30 till, till um, time to drive a bus. Someone drive a bus out there. And then, you know, they'll leave about 15 to 7. And then they'll be back. They'll come back for the second session at about 7.30. And then from 7.30 till about 9. About 9, we all get up and decide it's time to, uh, you know, go take a break somewhere. And then maybe start the rest of our day about 10 o'clock.
it sounds like I need to come out there. Uh, it's a great place. Wouldn't that be a, a it's fun, a great place. fun it's interview? A, it's a special place, and uh, you know, Myrtle has been a special community. It's just like all the rest around, you know. I think one of the stories that was told out there this 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 week, we were talking and we got to talking about. Uh, I think we were talking about Red John actually, and uh, we got to talking about when West Union and East Union opened their school. They opened them in 1961, um, and of course they opened their gyms. And uh, there was East Union that particular year had a really good basketball team. I think maybe one of the McGill guys that was playing out there was really good. And, I can't remember the name or two that they talked about that particular time, and then they went on to talking about who played at West Union in the in the '60s and and some of the teams they had. And uh, I mean, it's just conversation like that every day. Sometimes we have trouble remembering it, and we have to go find an expert somewhere in the county and talk to you know. Now, consolidation happened when I would have been in six in six years old. You know, I started school in 1961. That's when East Union and West Union started their schools. And, uh, you know, I just know a few of the places around that consolidated. I know East Union had Jericho, and uh, I think they had Sherman, and I'm not sure all the schools out there. I know West Union had Pinedale and Macedonia, um, Tippa Union at Myrtle, and um, some of those. But I don't remember much about consolidation. Now, I do remember, I do remember integration, because integration happened when I was uh, a junior in high school. I mean, not a junior in high school, but in, in the in junior high school. And, um, you know, when integration came around, we began to, to get the guys in and uh, the girls in, and we had sports together. You know, for us at Myrtle, we just we didn't have any problem at all. We just got together and began to go to school together, and we played basketball together and baseball together, and we had a big time. You know, during those days, if you had a disagreement with somebody, the principal would give you a pair of 16 ounce boxing gloves and you'd go outside at break and it'd be a big circle out there and if you had a disagreement you'd get in there and the principal would be out there and you'd box for about a minute and a half and by the time you'd box for about a minute and a half your arms were so tired you got you were happy to go ahead and shake that guy's hand and be friends with him <laughs> um well as I, I will tell you that today there, there's a little bit of difference in, in what it was when I first started in 85. In 85, Gerald Cadmus was around, um, Norris Astley was around, Elvis Thomas, uh, Charles Collier here in the county, the Kirkendalls were still around, and, and basketball, basketball at that particular time had such a rich group of coaches out there that was just unbelievably good. I mean, just you go anywhere you want to right here and you get your fanny beat in a heartbeat. Now, as far as the toughest venue, you could take Pine Grove, you could take um, Ingemar, you could take Myrtle, you could take West Union, you could take any of those schools and you could throw them in a sack and shake them up and you couldn't tell which one rolled out first because they were all tough. Um, you go into some of those gyms and by the time you got there to get dressed, they, the, the gyms would be absolutely packed and by the time you came out on the floor they were talking bad about you and uh, you just have to you just have to close your ears to it and you have to go do the job and actually as an official what helps you get through it is the fact that you know you you, you love the game if you don't love the game of sports stay out of officiating if you love the game of sports and you get into officiating you'll become involved into the game and you can almost shut out some of this talk that people fuss at you and talk about you. And um, you can just go ahead and do the job that you were, that you were sent out there to do. And it's fun, really. You know, we're struggling today to get officials into sports to officiate because of some of the things that have, that's happening in the country. You know, officials have been attacked in other parts of the country. They hadn't been attacked here in Mississippi that I'm aware of. But um, if you love sports and you loved it in high school, there's a chance for you to go out there and get that feeling again. Because when you got a big crowd and a game that's about to start out there, you know, you get you get a little of that fluid flowing and you get a little emotion going and 
you know, it's something that uh, will just grab a hold of you. And um, it, it's a lot of fun. And it's a lot of fun to get better. And I'll tell you something else. I started officiating high school girls volleyball um, last year. I had decided that I wanted to do that, so I had to learn the rules of that game. I had played a little volleyball, but it was not comparable to what high school girls volleyball is. But, you know, I, th these coaches and kids in, in Union County right now are, are, are improving in leaps and bounds in girls volleyball. They are, they are working hard at it. Well, proof's in the pudding. Ingemar won the state championship this year. New Albany girls, I mean, you go in to play there, you better be ready because those girls are going to play. They're going to play hard. Um, and it's something that's really, really, really caught on and really growing. If you're a basketball fan in New Albany or Union County and you have not been to a girls' high school volleyball game, you're missing out because it is action-packed. It is fast as it can be. And those girls will dive on the floor in a heartbeat to save that volleyball and to help their team. I've been on both sides of the fence. I've been a basketball coach and I've been a basketball official. And I'm gonna say this. I'm gonna say that I don't know that I've ever seen a call changed. I don't know that I've ever seen an official change since I've been officiating because the coach was fussing at the, the referee. Now, if they're, t if they're fussing about a judgment call, they're just wasting their time because judgment is just pure judgment. That's the reason they call it a judgment call. But uh, if they're fussing about a rule interpretation, you know, most of the time the referees will go over and if they're not sure about the answer, they'll go back and talk to the other guys and then, you know, they'll get it straight. But, uh, you know, the coaches do get upset. I, I you know, I officiated the game Tuesday and, uh, Coaches would just, I had one coach that was my age that I played high school basketball against. And he sat there and he coached his kids. He never said a word to the officials. He coached his kids. And I think if coaches would spend more time coaching their kids rather than fussing at officials, their kids might actually get a little better. Now that's not a popular opinion, but I know that that is something that can happen. You know, there is, there's a lot of stories to be told that, was, that happened during a time when people didn't have everything that they've got today, you know. They had enough to get a glove and a bat and maybe a catcher's mitt. I'm, I'm, I would be willing to bet you that a lot of those ball games were played. You know, they probably, they might have had a face mask. I'm not sure they had a face mask, but they had a catcher sitting back there trying to catch the ball. Um, I'm not sure if they had shin guards or a chest protector or anything like that, but they still played the game of baseball. And if the baseball went in the weeds, everybody stopped and went out and started walking the weeds down to find the baseball. Because there's just one. <laughs> most of the time. You know, honestly, most of the time. They might have an extra, but there wasn't many out there. They, it's not like today when you reach over in a five-gallon bucket full of baseballs and just throw another brand new one out there. It just wasn't that way. Uh, when you talk about the compress and the crossroads, where where are those places? All right, the compress um, would be right downtown here. Down, um, if you turn and go down the railroad tracks like you're going to Union Lumber Company, it's right there on your left right there where that building sits is what I understand. I never played at the compress, um, I, and I didn't see a game at the compress, but um, I know that's where it was. and. Um, then at the crossroads, if you go out, if you go out old 78 or 178 toward Myrtle and turn off Beulah right there, you go out that direction for maybe a couple, two or three miles, and then there's a road that comes from Myrtle, old 78 right there, and it crosses over and goes toward Plunkin Center out there. And I think the crossroads were right there. Uh, the crossroads, I know, had a pond out in right field. And if the, you know, if the ball was hit out in the pond, I think you just had to go out in the pond and get it. And we just played ball right there where the ball was wet or dry. Uh, <clears throat> you mentioned the kind of the end of that sort of baseball turning into adult softball. Um, what, what ended the adult softball? You know, I don't thing. know what it ended, ended the adult softball. I think, I think the rise of um, little league baseball and travel ball ended the adult softball. The adult softball right here, uh, there was guys that I, I played till I was 40 years old. 
And there were guys that I played, Tim Kent, Mayer, uh, Ronnie Will High, uh, Larry Ashmore, people like that. We played, we traveled to Oklahoma, we traveled to Florida, we traveled to North Carolina, we traveled to Minnesota. We traveled kind of all over the country playing uh, adult softball. And it was just, it was just as popular there as it was here. Tournaments every weekend. We might play two nights in the league here in New Albany in the Park Commission and then uh, go play a tournament on the weekend, play all night long on Friday night, rain or whatever, play in, just in mud up to your knees. They just kept playing. And there was a tournament every weekend somewhere that you could go to. And all of a sudden, it just kind of died away. And it, if you look right now, I, I tell you what, I was went by the Sportsplex um, this past weekend. And, you know, this is November, getting close to Thanksgiving. And I looked out there, and there was a travel ball tournament out there on the baseball field. And, you know, tr the emergence of travel ball, the emergence of fast pitch softball for girls, um, I guess just took the parents from doing something for themselves over to, you know, their kids. You know, I, I'm a little worried sometimes that I think that they may play a little too much. Um, you know, if you pay attention to the, oh, to the um, Little League Baseball and Travel Ball ended the adult softball. The adult softball right here, uh, there was guys that I, I played till I was 40 years old. And there were guys that I played, Tim Kent, Mayer, uh, Ronnie Will High, uh, Larry Ashmore, people like that. We played, we traveled to Oklahoma, we traveled to Florida, we traveled to North Carolina, we traveled to Minnesota. We traveled kind of all over the country playing uh, adult softball. And it was just, it was just as popular there as it was here. Tournaments every weekend. We might play two nights in the league here in New Albany in the Park Commission and then uh, go play a tournament on the weekend, play all night long on Friday night, rain or whatever, play in, just in mud up to your knees. They just kept playing. And there was a tournament every weekend somewhere that you could go to. And all of a sudden, it just kind of died away. And it, if you look right now, I, I tell you what, I was went by the Sportsplex um, this past weekend. And you know, this is November getting close to Thanksgiving. And I looked out there and there was a travel ball tournament out there on the baseball field. And you know, tr the emergence of travel ball, the emergence of fast pitch softball for girls, um, I guess just took the parents from doing something for themselves over to, you know, their kids. You know, I, I'm a little worried sometimes that I think that they may play a little too much um, you know, if you pay attention to the to the to the hype in the news media, you know the, the the professionals are telling you to hold off a little bit on the travel ball, especially the pitching, because they're seeing the, the surgeries that um, used to be specific to professional athletes, such as Tommy John surgery. The Tommy John surgery is creeping down into high school and has creeped into junior high school students when. And specifically, it was just for um, major league players just, just a few years ago. And today, you're here in junior high school kids having Tommy John surgery. I was there this morning from 7.30 until a quarter to nine. And uh, we didn't cover much sports this morning, but we got, we got a couple of guys out there that, that you know, they run, they run rabbit dogs every day. And that's their sport. You know, and we got another guy that that trains dogs that runs uh, and, and runs deer and runs coyotes in the uh, trials. Of course, we go from we go from rabbit dogs, we go to coon dogs, or we go to deer dogs, and then we go to basketball. And sometimes when we go to basketball, some of those guys get real quiet. You know, it's like, that's not their deal. But we still we still have good conversation. Now, COVID, you know, COVID kind of hurt us, and we've lost. Uh, I guess we've lost about 10 or 12 of those guys that just had rich stories to tell. And, you know, Paul Nolan actually wrote a book about Myrtle out there and wrote a book about some of the things in Myrtle and really created an interest and began to talk about some of the old things that happened out there and some of the, some of the things that, uh, that you just didn't, just didn't know, you know.
Um, how many guys were out there this morning? Okay, two, let's see, was it two, four, six, there was eight of us out there this morning and two more came in, made 10. Now, do y'all eat out there? Oh yeah, sausage and biscuit, cup of coffee. You know, some of them drink a Diet Mountain Dew or, you know, they, they fix breakfast and they, they serve breakfast to a lot of people coming in, going to work. And, you know, they, they, they just have their regular business, but they know that we're gonna cover up about three or four tables in the back back there. And what's the age range of, of men out there? Uh, I guess right now the average age range is in the 60s. So you know, one you know one or two is in the 70s, and um, but the average range would range from say 65 to 75. And sometimes it gets a little older, sometimes it gets a little younger. We actually they actually wrote an article in the Tupelo Journal about our group. You know, that was a few years ago, and yeah, they did a spread on us and. It was kind of funny, kind of good. Who's the person that um, that when they come in, you know, it's like, okay, well, that's that's the guy that everybody wants to see. Well, no, nah, that's a real good question. Okay. Now, I, I I've got a neighbor lives right behind me. Now he's been my lifelong friend, but when he comes in, everybody else usually kind of gets quiet because he's got more stories to tell than anybody else out there. You know, he's, he's, kind of the, he's kind of the center of the conversation and he likes, well, he's the center of the conversation kind of on sports. That's Elvis Thomas. The center of conversation on dogs is gonna be Jerry Robbins. The center of conversation on rabbit dogs is gonna be Donnie <laughs> Nolan and Tommy Chisholm. <laughs> but, you know, we kind of, we kind of rib each other a little bit, you know, we kind of, we kind of get after each other a little, and then we talk, we'll talk about sports, or we'll, you know, we just, you know, we'll get on politics, we get on anything out there. Uh, Larry Chun was Little Red, and, uh, you know, right off the top of my head, I can't remember what Big Red's name, but, he, you know, most people just called him Red. You know, after he got out of high school, Red was just his name. And, now, why were they called Red? Well, he's kind of red-faced and uh, he's kind of red-headed a little bit. And sometimes when he played high school basketball, he'd start slapping his head a little bit when he'd come out ready to play. And when he came out ready to play, you better get out of his way. <laughs> but that was in, you know, we're talking 1961, you know. And we're playing in a small gym. The gym is um, absolutely crowded. The gym is full of cigarette smoke or cigar smoke or pipe smoke or whatever's there. You know, and uh, the fact people are just packed in there like sardines. Wow. Uh, and and that, that atmosphere, uh, you know, that atmosphere kind of began to go away a little bit, you know, in the 70s, later 70s. And then, you know, of course, everybody in the house kind of got newer facilities and things like that. You know, Blue Mountain still plays in their gym that I played in in high school basketball. And it's kind of a real small court, but it's still the same old style gym around. There's a couple of those still left around. And a lot of those people, you know, that played during those early 60s and played in the old facilities and played, you know, Macedonia, Pinedale, some of those places like that, you know, they're kind of getting at the age now that, that we're losing a lot of them. So there's a lot of, there's a lot of different directions that conversations can go, you know, with people that uh, that played in those at those places prior to consolidation and then right after consolidation. Calibiot, Calibiot in Tippa County has the old gym there that they played in and I think that was prior to consolidation but it is, the last time I was in Calibiot gym it was almost immaculate. I mean it was just well taken care of and you could tell the community put a lot of pride in that in that school and that's a junior high school now and they it's really well taken care of. Um, is there one that you go, because you, I guess you probably travel around a lot of oh, times yeah. more than the average person. Is there one that you go into and you just think, like, it just feels like you're in a, a movie or something, like an old? Well, some of them, but Blue Mountain would be that way just a little bit. Um, and then Pine Grove is kind of, is, is kind of that way. They, but they're going to pack that gym regularly um you know when you start talking about the schools opening up in 64 65 that's when that's when the myrtle gym was opened up and when the ingemar was opened up it opened up 
in 1964-65, that would have been Ray Vance's senior year at Myrtle. I mean, you're talking about new facilities at that time. They're still great facilities. But over the years, you know, I, I can go back to starting to go into those ball games in 64 and 65. I've seen those gyms um, just absolutely packed with people and people trying to get in. As a matter of fact, I left a picture here at the um, museum with Jill of a game that happened in 1979. And that picture is here, still here in the museum somewhere of what I consider to be the best two, two high school boys basketball games I've ever seen. Uh, and you couldn't even get in the gym by 4.35 o'clock. And there were three games that night and you could not get in the door. Well, where was that? That was here in your office. And what was that? Who were the teams? That was 1970. That was that was the Christmas of 1978. And uh, Norris Ashley had uh, his really good Ingemar basketball team. They actually won the Grand Slam that year. Norris, I mean, I think y'all had conversations with him here at the gym. Norris was the coach. Frank Durham. Um, um, Gosh, um, Green, James Green, some of those people, Mark Buskirk. I, I think I think that basketball team may have been the best complete basketball team that I've seen in my lifetime. Uh, they were just fundamentally sound and could shoot the basketball. And James Green was just he was he was he was absolutely fantastic in the paint. But Ingemar played Tupelo that night. And New Albany played Boone. So that was Norris Ashley against Randy Hodges and Tupelo, small 1A school against the, one of the largest schools in the state. And then Ingemar beat Tupelo that night. And then you had New Albany against Boone. You had Harvey Childers against uh, Gerald Cadness, who Gerald Cadness is probably one of the greatest coaches that's ever walked in the state of Mississippi. And of course, it was just, just a huge crowd. I was actually on uh, duty as a student teacher that year. And uh, I got there, I didn't even leave school that day. I just stayed and they started coming in about 3.30 that afternoon. And it, it, I, I had to stand up in a chair just to be seen. And you know, I stood by, I stood by a man that, who probably saw as many high school basketball games as anybody in this area, that was Billy Bison. His son was superintendent here in Union County for a while, and his other son was a supervisor of officials and uh, a signer of officials, Keith Basel. But um, in that game that night, Billy was so involved in the games, when, when James Green got the basketball inside, he just let out a blood-curdling yell and throw his fist out just as hard as he could. He'd say, he's a machine! <laughs> and I don't know if everybody in the gym heard him, but I did. I was standing right by him. I had to stand up to see it. I, I, I didn't leave school. And there was three or four rows of people in front of me trying to see the game sitting down on the floor. So, I mean, just fantastic, fantastic games played. And those, that, that night, I mean, that night, I don't believe I've ever seen anything in the state tournament. I don't believe I've ever seen anything any better than what I saw that night. And then the next night, New Albany played Ingemar. And uh, with no time on the clock, well, just a few seconds on the clock, uh, Gary Golden, supposedly, you know, we thought the referee might have missed the call, but, you know, one of those things that happened. Gary Golden supposedly went over James Green's back, uh, and the referee called a foul, and no time on the clock, James Green goes down with ice water running through his veins down there and drains two free throws and bam, ball game's over. They were behind one point when he went to the line down there. He went to the line, drained two free throws, and that game ended. And that was one for the ages. That was Ingemar beating New Albany. They did. Time. Now that picture, like I tell you, that picture's here in the museum somewhere. I'll have to find that. Who won the uh, the night before when New Albany played? Uh, did you say Boonville? Yeah, New Albany beat Boonville that okay. night. Okay. 
See, the first year Harvey came to New Albany, Harvey was a coach at Myrtle. He stayed out of coaching in 1976. He came back in 1977, and at that time, at that time, Bob Co Bill Cossett was a sports writer at the Gazette, and Bill was an influential sports writer because he really he really wrote the articles, and you know he he put a lot of pressure on people to make sure that when you hired a basketball coach or a football coach that you hired the best that was available. Well, in '77, New Albany hired Harvey Childers. And in that 77 season, they were knocking around about 500. And I think they got down at Water Valley. I believe Water Valley was the school they were playing at. And it was playing in the playoffs. And I think Gary Golden hit one from behind center court. And from that point on, they were on a mission. Kind of like Ole Miss uh, baseball this past year. You know, they went to the national championship. That year, Gary Golden hit that shot. And it just looked like it energized that whole team in 77 because at that time they went straight through the state tournament and won the state tournament that year against Gerald Cadmus' team. Um, Gerald Cadmus' team, every one of his teams were legendary. Uh, as a matter of fact, Elvis Thomas' team in 68 that he played on and he played for Harvey Childers, I think two of the three games they lost was against New Site and that was coached by uh, Gerald Cadness and Usight won like three or four state championships in a row in the, in, the, in the late 60s. It's a small world, this group of people. It is. How did uh, Bill Cossett's writing influence the outcome of anything? Well, uh, the Gazette at that particular time was such a popular newspaper I mean, you know, I have myself, I, on Tuesday nights in the 70s, in the 60s, on Tuesday nights, I was headed, you know, I think it was Tuesday, I mean, it would come out late Tuesday night, you know, for the Wednesday paper. Uh, we would go to the stores and sit in the vehicles and wait on the Gazette to be delivered. It was such a popular reading at that time. You know, there wasn't any internet, there wasn't anything like that, you know, and the Gazette, you know, was just was just it was just the newspaper to go to. Tupelo had uh, rounded about with Bill Ross, and it was the entire Northeast Mississippi, and he was he was one of the great greatest columnists that they've ever had. And Bill Cossett was just sitting right in there behind him because he wrote about New Albany and Union County sports and the people involved. And I'll be honest with you, I'll be honest with you, the superintendents paid attention a lot to what uh, Bill Cossett was writing in his in his articles because you know if, if, if he was pumping this guy up over here and, and, and he was talking about how good he was and this that and the other that's when they got ready to hire somebody that's who they were looking at I guess it put a little pressure on them. you know I guess his articles were were so good and so influential that um, that it put a little pressure on people around who was uh, looking at those and they said, well, this is who, is who we need for a coach. And, you know, that superintendent was trying to make sure that he got it right. Kind of like Auburn's going through right now with their with their football coach. You know, they're trying to find somebody. And, you know, John Cohen, who's the new athletic director down there, is, it, you know, he's got to get it right. He's got to get it right. And in those days, in those days, a principal and a superintendent, when they were hiring a basketball coach or a football coach, you know, they needed to get it right. And uh, Bill Cossett, Bill Cossett was really influential in sports, and uh, you know, and during that time that he was writing his articles. And then, of course, you know, technology comes along, and newspapers kind of struggle, and this, that, and the other for things. And uh, you just don't see that much anymore. You don't see the, the the articles in the newspaper like you used to see, like uh, like Bill and like uh, Bill Ross and those kind of people wrote. How would Bill Cossett get his information? You know, um, he was friends with all the coaches. Um, he kept up with all the games. I mean, he was a, kind of a statistician, you know. He was really involved in New Albany sports. Uh, he was involved in, in Northeast Mississippi sports. Um, I mean, he knew the people. He knew the people. He would get out and do the articles, and, uh, you know, he would... He would pump Norris Ashley, and he would pump Harvey Childers and uh, Elvis Thomas, and a lot of those guys who were, were were worthy of those words that he was writing. You know, he 
he called Harvey Chisholm the, the, the Wizard of New Albany Wood, I believe is what it was, you know, after uh, John Wooden at uh, UCLA. Kind of a, kind of a spinoff, but uh, he just was, he was just good at what he did. Did he ever make uh, people mad? Oh, I'm sure, yeah. If he wrote an article about New Albany and, and, and Harvey Chivers, he made the people at Ingemar mad. If he wrote an article about the people at Ingemar and Norris Ashton and their great teams, he made the people at New Albany mad. And then vice versa with all these other guys. There is an intense rivalry between New Albany School and any county school. An intense rivalry. Now that rivalry really, it, it in the last several years, has been between New Albany and Ingemar. Now, at, at one time, it was New Albany and Myrtle, and uh, it's still it's still an intense route. I will tell you this. I will tell you that any time, during the time that I was in school administration, that uh, New Albany and Ingemar played, New Albany and Myrtle played, superintendents would say, okay, I need, need to make sure we got people on duty at the ball game. Whether it was our place or the other place, you know, we got to have people there. We need... We need security there. We need to make sure that people know that they got to behave and they can't get upset and ugly. We're going to have a, a, a ball game and we're going to be friends when it's over and we're going to step out and go the other way. Chuck Garrett was really good with that. He was really good with, you know, taking care of the details that made sure that the thing went off without a hitch. You think they were worried more about Students misbehaving or the adults well, actually, misbehaving? New Myrtle had kind of a little fight out there at one time. I hate to bring that up because it's been dead and we want to keep it buried. <laughs> you know, we want to keep. We don't want to. We don't want to bring up a. You know, they don't. You know, don't beat a. Don't beat a, uh, a sleeping lion. You know, or a sleeping dog. Uh, but New Albany and Myrtle actually had a little scuffle out there one night after the ball game, and some people kind of got into it on the floor and kind of in the bleachers, and you know they. They actually maybe stopped playing each other for, for a little while, but and, and that's sad. That is that is so sad because the games are so intense and so good that um, you know it, it's something it's something that needs to be handled. You know, kind of like Chuck Garrett or John Whedon would do, and they would just take care of business. You know, uh, Mr. Whedon was a great superintendent, great principal, and. Um, you know, they would just get in there and dig in their heels and say, we're going to do this. You know, we're going to have this game. We're going to play it. And everybody's going to behave. If they're not, we're going to see that they do. And, you know, those games need to be played. Those games need to be played. They don't. It, 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 it's easy to say, we're just not going to play each other. But the hardest thing to do is say, we're going to do the job that it takes to make this happen simply because of the tradition of the past and the vision for the future.